things to say to you today, and I promise you, I am not going to be preaching. The first is that the pandemic has disrupted our way of life in ways that we have not yet fully understood. When children are not able to go to school and are deprived of a year of learning or two, almost two years of learning, the impact of that on a country like Jamaica is incalculable. So priority number one for this government but also for your household, I'm going to substitute that word now with another one, the priority for your family, which is the theme of our gathering today, must be to get our children back in school. I am placing that above everything else right now. The pandemic has revealed, which we have always known, that our family structure is not evenly strong enough across the society to take care of our children without the support of the schools. That's a controversial statement. I'm expecting somebody to say something about it. However, the truth is that there are some families that simply cannot take care of their children. There are some families that did very well during the pandemic, and their children probably would have learned much more being at home, being online, being comfortable, having access to almost individual attention from parents who could afford to take time off from work to oversee, thus increasing the bond between parent and child. There, there are families who have grown stronger and their kids much more brilliant in the pandemic. But that is not the case for the vast majority of Jamaican families. When mothers can't take the time off from work, when they have to share the one phone or tablet if they are lucky, when they don't have any internet, It's a struggle, so they, they would have suffered. But the suffering goes deeper. Mother gets frustrated, father gets frustrated, increased abuse of children, sometimes not even deliberate, but just the anger, the raised voice, the shout, and then there is the giving up. Just can't bother. If you get on, you get on. If you learn anything, then lucky you. I see it in my own constituency. Children are all over the place, running up and down. Me as well, they were in school. So we already have enough problems that we cannot continue to keep our children out of school as a shielding measure to control the pandemic. You heard what I said a while ago? So we kept the children out of school as a means of shielding the population from a rapid spread of the virus. We cannot continue to do that any longer.
So the children will have to go back to school. They will have to learn how to live with the virus. But you will have to structure your household differently. Because I want you to see the trade-off now. When everybody is under the stay-at-home order, the household is shielded because people aren't moving out that much. But when the household is required, now everybody goes back to work and everybody goes back to school. If there is an elderly person in your home or someone with comorbidities who is vulnerable, when parents return from work and children return from school, it is likely that they could take home the virus with them. And so, whilst the government will not be putting in this general shielding measure anymore, families must now figure out how they are going to shield and protect the vulnerable in their homes. you agree with that? So as you send your children out to school, you have to protect grandma. So I just thought I'd share that with you. And this is what I mean when I say that the government strategy has to shift from these general, crude, oftentimes shielding measures to now your own personal responsibility in managing your own health and that of your family. You will have to take some responsibility for that. Because one of the things I, I struggled with in the pandemic, the very measures that kept us safe, that kept our numbers low, the same measures people turn around and cost me for them. It's true, but that's, that's how it is. That's how it is, and we, we understand that, and we, we recognize. But just from the management of the country, that bigger perspective, we cannot continue to trade off the future for this current state of the pandemic. I believe we have managed it well. People are well informed. People know what to do. Vaccines are available. You know what to do. Now, there have been various misinterpretations to say we are not going to treat people who are ill and so forth. That's not the case. I saw the Minister of Health recently touring um, a new addition of space specifically for COVID um, at, uh, I believe it's the Sablamara Hospital. And we are doing that right across the country, still reserving beds and making provisions. I, through my foundation and some overseas efforts, got 19 oxygen concentrators for hospitals in Jamaica. The Ministry of Health is in the process of procuring another 100. So we are building up capacity to be able to treat. But we require you to take personal responsibility for your health as well. Now, I recall when I was much younger, uh, and I still consider myself young, a few grays coming in, but it's the, it's the sign of the, the job. Sign of the job. We would line up in primary school in the 80s, and we'd have to hold back our head, and they would put that drop on your tongue. How many of you remember that? That was the polio vaccine. I know it's a sensitive subject. and I know it's a, it's a difficult subject for church leaders. So please, just bear with me while I speak about the issue. Um, firstly, the government has never said that it is going to force anyone to take the vaccine. I just want that to be clear because I have heard it on pulpits before from pastors who 
sound very convincing as if to say that you know the government is a part of some conspiracy i want that to be clear government is not a part of any vaccine conspiracy we live in a democracy but more than that we live in a liberal democracy so the rights and freedoms of the people take priority and I respect that I am the greatest advocate for the liberal democracy so the government is always seized with this understanding of how it executes public policy in a democracy. Before there is anything that could even vaguely resemble a mandate, there has to be widespread public understanding and agreement that this is the way forward. Now what I detect is that there is great hesitation about vaccines because people just don't know enough about vaccines. And there are those who really feel that it is an invasion of my own right to determine what gets into my body. There are people who are worried about whether or not it is going to affect their virility or fertility. And then, of course, there are those who believe that there is a microchip in the vaccine. Why that needle is so small, I don't know. <laughs> So the government has embarked on a public education campaign. The Minister of Health is always in the media explaining to people what, what we're doing. Explaining to people what the vaccines are about. The take-up has been very slow. Uh, the last time I checked, we would have been about 21% fully vaccinated. Now, here is what we do know, and which is, I don't see anything that has successfully disputed the facts that I'm about to point out. Persons who are fully vaccinated have a much lower risk of contracting a severe form of the disease. That, that, that has not been, this, that is the fact. The second fact is that persons who are vaccinated are far less likely to be hospitalized. And in fact, the vast majority of persons who are in hospitals who require vaccination, are, who, who require hospitalization rather, are not vaccinated. Those are the facts. Now, if you are uncomfortable with getting vaccinated, I urge you to consider this. The virus could eventually disappear as it mutates its way through. It could. The truth is we do not know when it will happen. People were estimating that it would have, you know, disappeared. It would be a seasonal thing and it would disappear. What we're seeing is it, this, it just has the ability to, to keep going over a year. So we can't keep this holding position of saying, all right, you don't take the vaccine, so we're going to shield you. We're going to limit movement so that you don't get it. We're going to put on curfews so that you don't get it. 
we're going to limit the amount of people who come to church, for example, because the church population would generally have a higher percentage of older persons who would be highly representative of the vulnerable group. We will have to limit gatherings and so forth otherwise. Then we'll have to take our children out of school and then we'll have to tell people, all right, work from home if you can. In order that we don't get too many people infected, getting a serious form of the disease, and then requiring hospitalization over and above the bed spaces that we have. We have had spikes where this has happened, where the hospitalization is over and above what we could comfortably accommodate. And you would see people sitting in the hallways of the hospital with oxygen. We couldn't find beds for them. Then you hear, uh, you know, oxygen is short and the government didn't plan and all the other issues that would have arisen. We can't keep doing that. Worse, we can't do any more no movement days, lockdown days, because that would just totally destroy the economy. So there is a kind of personal choice that we have to balance. If we abandon these measures, what is going to protect you? There are some of you who feel, well, you know, We can take all kinds of bush tea and all kinds of other things. What, what we know so far is that you know, there is very little defense that will prevent you from being infected. A strong immune system is not necessarily just like the vaccines is not necessarily going to prevent you from being infected. What it will do is that if you get infected, your illness is likely to be less or you may not have any symptoms, right? So what you, what you want to do is, yes, strengthen your immune system. You want to make sure that you're taking your vitamins and so forth. But there is one other thing that you can do, and that is you can get immunized. Yes, you can get immunized. In the same way that we are so glad, happy to get our kids immunized, there is scarcely a mother who does not take her child to the doctor or to the clinic to ensure that they get those shots at the specified time. Why? Because you know that this is important to help your child's immunity against some of these very dangerous diseases. So I'm not here trying to you know, force immunization on anyone. I'm just trying to reason with you so that you can see the challenges that the government have. How do I keep the population safe, keep the economy going? And what is happening now is that the more measures that I have to put in place to keep you safe, it is destroying the economy and the society. When there is an alternative way, if you decide to take personal responsibility for your health, building your immune system, following the protocols of mask wearing, social distancing, but at the same time, getting immunized. Right? That will help us to come out of the conundrum. Because I want to shift a little bit now to talk about what has happened to the society since the pandemic. And what has happened, I mean, 2021 has been the year of the bizarre. Some strange things have happened in Jamaica, which uh, we've never seen them. I mean, you know, we've never seen them happen before. But the disruption in our daily routines 
has caused many persons to be searching for answers. So the mental health and wellness of the population has been affected by the pandemic. And it's not just in Jamaica, it's, it's, it's all over. Now you may not see the difference in your own life, but if you were to step back for a moment and just look at the bigger landscape, you would detect it that there is a shift in the mood of the population. Very pessimistic outlook on the future. Very quick to attack. So there is an increase in violence. And then the greater uncertainty in the country has created a space in which false prophets can emerge. Matthew 24, verse 11. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. Timothy 4, 3 to 4. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And will turn away. will turn away from the truth and wander off into myths. Have you seen that happen in Jamaica recently? Turning away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. We have seen this happen. I don't have to go into the examples. As I speak, they are flashing before your eyes. You see them on social media. You are bombarded with them every day. Nonsense being preached to you every single day. But some of you believe it. So you don't know what to believe, you just say, sure. But this constant diet of false prophets, people who come on social media and tell you all kinds of things, and you listen to it, and it affects your mood, then you get angry, then you say, sure, be not follow not when the government tell me. Then it becomes a constant struggle now to get the society back on track. Whilst you accumulate teachings to suit your own passions. Whilst turning away from listening to the truth and wandering off into myths. Beware of the false prophets. Miss Sue, I am not going to preach. So, this year is our 60th year, our Diamond Jubilee. I want the nation to come back together, to reflect on the truth, 
to identify the people who are the real prophets, the true prophets. And the Bible gives you directions as to how to identify who are the real prophets. And I am not now using the term prophets in the biblical sense, please. But the leaders who provide guidance and information to the public. They don't just emerge on the scene. Out of nowhere on Facebook and Twitter and all kind of foolishness. They have been with you for decades. Providing you with knowledge and information. Tried, tested and proven. You can see their track records and what they say they will do. It gets done. Many of these people who you see coming up, talking all kind of foolishness, they are mercenaries. Being paid to execute an agenda. To mislead and misdirect and disrupt. I'm urging every Jamaican to refocus at this time. As we Look towards the celebration of our 60th. The country must be unified. And that's why I'm not, I'm not going to allow any activity to take place that is going to be de divisive in this time. The 60th year is an important year. We are in the decade when we should be achieving Vision 2030. Right, Mark? Vision 2030 is the time in 2030 when we should achieve developed country status. I have been thinking about it, and I think we need to do an assessment as to exactly where we are now. There is a built-in process in the Vision 2030 process that will help us to understand that, but I'm going to also seek to do a kind of external review as to where we are for our benchmarks against getting to Vision 2030. Because I don't think that we are all serious and on the same page about getting to that Vision 2030. And a part of that Vision 2030 is the peace of the country. The peace, right? Because what we have a challenge in Jamaica with, and I'm sorry I missed the presentation by the constabulary. Um, people say we have a, you know, a violence problem, we have a crime problem, uh, a murder, homicide problem. All of those are you know, sub-elements of the larger problem, Bishop Pitkin. Peace. Country is not at peace. Families are not at peace. Right? Over 70% of homicides committed in Jamaica, murders, are gang related. But 20%, 25% thereabouts are what you could describe as domestic intimate partner and some random killings, 20%. And that is as a result of the lack of peace. So the family is very important in building peace. So we have to focus on how we're going to get the family to be the unit of peace and that will have an impact on the 20%. But the family is a component of another important structure in the society, and that is a community. And our communities are not at peace. You have gangs in the communities that are conducting internecine wars and feuds, literally. And those gangs conducting this warfare in your communities account for 70% of the murders. 
I read in the papers today of the two brothers who were murdered in Westmoreland. I am so sorry about it. And the sister saying, Prime Minister, I, I just want to talk to you about it. I, I just want to, I, it's an appeal to hear what are our leaders doing about this. She's not quarreling, she's not blaming, she's not, she, she didn't even sound angry. Obviously she was distraught, but she says, Prime Minister, just come talk to me about it. Help me to make sense of it. Why? Why they killed my brother? Why you kill the ten year old? Why? I go to my bed with these things on my conscience every night. I know that I have tried. It's a minefield. Because every turn you make, there is someone who is trying to stop it. And I have to wonder, are they in support of the criminals in the country? The 10 year old didn't have to die. She didn't have to die, man. We are there so he down there. We put it in Westmoreland. The two brothers never had to die, man. We said we have to put in stronger measures for guns. And there are those people in Jamaica who turn them out on it. As if to say we must allow the criminals to have the guns. When you see me say what I say, because I'm a firm believer, I'm what you call pro-life. But when I say I would make an exception, the JDF intercepted a boat coming in from Haiti. We have intercepted many boats coming in from Haiti and from South American countries. When we intercept them, you know what they do? They throw off what they have into the water. So you're not likely to be able to get the guns. They threw it off. But this one, we were able to recover two firearms. We are increasing our capacity to have domain control of our territorial waters. People wonder why we're spending all of this money. Because we have to stop the guns coming in. That's why we're putting the boats out there. And we're going to put more out there. So we can control our, our territorial waters. Talk about crime plan. It's the first time Jamaica has a plan that is being executed. And not just talk, money behind it. We looked at the issue illegal weapons. Now, the, you see, the society is so duplicitous in a way, trying to find the right word to convey the thought. There are people who don't want to see stronger 
penalties for the possession of illegal firearms because they believe that those measures will apply to persons who own firearms legally. If you see what I'm saying. So those persons who own firearms legally don't want to be caught in tougher penalties for illegal firearms. I want to make it absolutely clear. Jamaica does not have a significant crime problem with, with, with legal firearms, meaning firearms that you went to the FLA, you did your interview, they did your background check, they determined that you're fit and proper, you went to training, and you have to relicense your firearm every year. Why? Because we know who has the gun. The gun is in a registry. If it is fired, if it is shot, we can trace back. So those people don't need to worry. That's not, that's not no target for you. What we have a problem with, and the society doesn't want to recognize it, for decades, guns have been allowed to come into our country in the barrel, in the Big Ben rice, in the soap powder box, wrap up in the clothes, and through our various illegal ports of entry, dotted right across the island. And it has accumulated now to a point where everybody have a gun. You can't talk to the man because he have a gun. And Father Richards, I attended a, a sermon that you preached. And uh, you did a DJ. You remember that? Well, these guns, Archbishop, don't join church. They don't join church. They are used indiscriminately. And I want us to dismiss this thought out of hand that you can possess an illegal firearm to protect yourself. That must be dismissed. That cannot be a defense. We must get tough on illegal guns in the country. If you possess an illegal gun, it is only for one purpose, and that is to kill someone. No other reason to have an illegal gun. So all those who want to go, talk, go and go talk again, we are strong on this. And our administration is bringing this bill to Parliament, and I am expecting the full support of the Parliament in passing the legislation to show that Jamaica in our 60th year will remove from our society illegal guns and other weapons. The SOE is a tool that is always available. There are constitutional issues around it. It would appear that those issues far outweigh saving the lives of innocent Jamaicans. It is not a tool that the government can use by itself. It requires a supermajority in Parliament to do it. But the government is always willing to use it because we have devised a mechanism that ensures that the rights and the lives of Jamaicans are protected in its use. We have to move speedily to get those constitutional matters resolved. But there are bigger problems than that. 
as I end. Jamaica has always taken a very unsophisticated approach to its national security. The average person believes we are an island and there are really no threats to us. Rarely we see or make a connection to the bigger threats around us and what could happen. From people coming into our state, pretending that they have sovereignty over areas. We have seen this before, and we can see in other countries what that has morphed into when territorial sovereignty is challenged, especially by criminals who try to take over areas. We have seen communities disintegrate and devolve into areas in which our security forces have difficulty policing. We cannot be trivial and superficial in these matters. Our security must be treated with the highest level of sophistication and seriousness because the threats are real. We must protect our borders and we must guard our sovereignty jealously. Not one inch of Jamaica must be taken over by anyone who is not the representative of the state of Jamaica. That is the recipe that we have seen in countries in South America and all over the world where criminal gangs take territory and then eventually end up challenging the state. And then it becomes extremely difficult. So we think, oh, it's just a little gang warfare. Oh, it's just man over there, so a fight against man over there. So. Not seeing how man over there, so a fight against man over there, so prevent you from walking down that road, prevent the police from properly getting the area under control and guaranteeing you peace, and how that happening replicated all around the country breaks down the state. That will not happen under me as your prime minister. This is why you have seen us start to treat these gangs seriously. Putting them before the courts one by one. It's a long, tedious process, as you can see. But nobody will accuse the JCF and the JDF, whilst I am prime minister, of any human rights abuse. So we will do these things judicially. No extrajudicial business. And that is the steady plan that you're seeing unfolding month after month, gangs being investigated and brought before the courts. Because that is our system in our liberal democracy. In the interim, we need to get the murders down. It's one thing to bring a man to court and have him punished, but then the life gone. So whilst we're doing crime fighting, we need the SOEs for life saving. And that's what they are, a life saving strategy. So happy new year, ladies and gentlemen. You know, I love you. And I'm so happy to have had the opportunity to come and reason with you. God bless you. God bless Jamaica.